Prague, November 1989. The former Czechoslovakia demands an end to communist rule. In less than a month, the crowds gathered in Prague's Wenchester Square were victorious. Their peaceful revolution paved the way for democracy, and with it, the free market. Nowadays, it's tourists that flock to Wenchester Square. The country that had one of the most restrictive travel policies in Central Europe has become a sort of medieval Disneyland. Its architectural riches famous the world over. Prague is a cosmopolitan city now. Over the last 10 years, its course has been relentlessly upwardly mobile. For a while, the rise of Václav Havel, the country's poet-turned-president, was just as meteoric. He was the Velvet Revolution's hero, bestowed with almost saint-like status. Now, every bookshop in Prague contains evidence of Havel's supposed downfall. Czech citizens are presented with an array of cheap paperbacks filled with insider accounts, unauthorized biographies, and books by former secretaries charting his decline. Most include the story of Havel's relationship with Dagmar, the unpopular actress he married after the death of his wife. From behind the walls of Prague Castle, where Havel's office is based, stories have emerged in one book of Dagmar's reported appeal to witches to cure her husband's recent illness. For the book's author, a member of a press corps newly freed from communist censorship, Havel's attempts to have the book suppressed have brought an unexpected bonus. It was an incredible advertisement for the book when this particular president wanted to censor it, like they used to censor his books and take me to court. Across town in Czech television, another thorn in the side of former dissidents like Václav Havel is being sharpened by producer Eva Prohaskova. She's working on a revival of a 70s television program about a police chief called Major Zeman who helps rid the communist regime of its enemies. The program is laden with propaganda, but Prohaskova says it's merely an educational tool designed to teach young Czechs about their history. Major Zeman cannot open our eyes, but the program can be a way of looking at and dealing with events in our totalitarian past. It can be a way of admitting that we've taken part in them in one way or another. Because every person in this country took part in those events, and we want to open up a public debate about them. These are things that many public figures aren't happy to see. The programs and the televised discussions that follow have done well in the ratings, but they've not found favor with their target audience. Most young Czechs see Major Zeman as a quaint piece of communist kitsch, an interesting oddity from the past rather than something educational. They can't understand why anyone would think it was useful or why former dissidents would think it detrimental and want to ban it. Discovering what their country was like under communism isn't something that most typical Prague 20-somethings want to do. Like Clara Tomaskova and her boyfriend Milan, they're more interested in the future. It's been a long time ago and I don't see the point why now it's been brought up back because nobody can change it. Nobody can change the history. And Czech people, young people, they maybe look at this, think they think, okay, that was it. It's a past, but let's continue. Let's go on. In the Czech Parliament, though, the past is still very much part of the present. The Communist Party still controls 12% of the New Republic's Parliament and to right-wing politicians, the communists still pose a threat, aided and abetted by Czech TV. Mikhail Simkanich, a member of the Czech Right Party, believes that television programs like Major Zeman are propagating communist ideology and as such should be declared illegal. State-run television is funded by taxes paid by Czech citizens and it's putting a program on air which celebrates communist ideology. We think it's against the law. For most Czechs, though, it's not the past that's the problem. They're preoccupied with the present, with being part of an economy that's in a state of transformation. The new Czech Republic is marching to a different economic tune these days, 
one that the Skoda car plant in the provincial town of Nada Boleslav has learned to play well. The dignitaries and politicians gathered here are celebrating the opening of a new production line, a development that will mean jobs for another 3,000 workers on top of the nearly 23,000 already employed here. Success for Skoda has come at a price. The company has had to adapt to survive over the last 10 years, and today it's mostly German-owned. Its president believes that entering a joint venture with Volkswagen is what saved Skoda from collapse. For Skoda, the joint venture was a question of survival. If we look at the other car manufacturers in Eastern Europe who don't have strong strategic partners, we see that all of them are disappearing or have only a marginal influence in the market. And without Volkswagen, the same would probably have happened to Skoda. For many Czechs, Skoda is the pride of the nation's automobile industry. The company produced the former Czechoslovakia's first car in 1905 and was nationalized by the communists in 1948. Most workers today, though, recognize that communist rule brought mismanagement, resulting in the production of fuel guzzling, low-quality cars. They've seen the problems that many other former Eastern Bloc industries have faced since 1989, when free market forces accompanied the introduction of democratic rule. Their company may now be 70% German-owned, but in the eight years since the Czech government began divesting its ownership of Skoda, the cars they produce have proved relatively successful and they still have jobs. The factory's employees grudgingly accept German control. Without it, most of them acknowledge that their livelihoods would have been destroyed. Even though I'm not happy with German ownership, I know that Volkswagen has the strength to develop Skoda for the future. When Volkswagen came, everything was put in order, the working conditions, everything, and they obtained a market for our cars. Without them, we wouldn't have the markets. Despite economic uncertainty, most Czechs don't look back to see the huge transformation that's taken place. They want a better future today. I, I have to admit that the people don't compare the life now with the life 10 years ago. The, the people compare the life now with their expectations. And to my great regret, uh, the expectations sometimes grow faster than the reality. So the gap between expectations and reality is the same or maybe even growing so this is the problem but i'm absolutely sure that the, that the change is uh, enormous for some the good times have already arrived on the outskirts of prague a new supply business is being opened by businessman vaclav fischer one of the republic's most popular politicians and one of its wealthiest citizens Fischer emigrated to Germany 20 years ago, but came back after the revolution to set up the country's most successful travel agency, Fischer Travel. A decade ago, he says most people would have seen him as a capitalist parasite. Now, though, attitudes are different. I'm sure that the way Czechs view honest, hard work is changing. People are now beginning to respect entrepreneurs, and the word entrepreneur is losing its bad connotation. And it's becoming a synonym for something that people admire. Fischer has now launched his own airline, Fischer Air, becoming a Czech version of Richard Branson. His success has grown as thousands of Czech Republic citizens use his company to travel abroad, indulging one of the first freedoms granted to them after the fall of communism. With every Fisher plane that takes off and lands in Prague, the Soviet era becomes a more distant memory.